liar, so today's off to a great start. Uh, it is going to be 40 degrees today. He walked in, he's like, it does not feel like 40 yet, but it's supposed to be 40 degrees today. So uh, we're getting there, one step closer to spring, right? One step closer to spring. Uh, so anyways, welcome to Novesta. I'm glad that you were here this morning. Uh, the days are a little longer, right? There's a little more hope in the horizon. I know we're still going to have some zeros in cold, but uh, soon enough we'll be outside enjoying the weather instead of just hiding from it. So uh, just a couple of announcements as we get started this morning. Uh, you'll see some of them up behind me here, but we do have a blood drive coming up this Thursday. If you're able to participate, we would love for you to be a part of that. Um, blood, blood supplies are critically low from everything that I understand. And so if you're able, it's a way to help and to encourage people. Um, it's not the only way to give uh, to help humanity, but it's a great way to help others um, if you're able to do that. So that's coming up. Um, also see up there is Super Dads, Super Lads, or a Super Superhero Day. Um, I, I always get the title wrong. Right there, that one, the Superman and Super Lad Day. Um, what that is is for men, boys, grandmas, or grandpas, um, uncles, it's an opportunity to just be kind of enjoying as boys. We did the tea party for the ladies a, a month ago. Uh, coming up in a couple of weeks, we're going to do the Superman, Super Lad Day. Really want to encourage you to consider that, especially if you've got little, little guys. Um, you know, the statistics uh, have been confirmed over and over and over again. If we as men take the lead in our families, uh, spiritually speaking, almost always the family is going to follow. And for too long in too many places for too many generations, us guys have taken a back seat. We've been like, ah, we'll let the wife handle it. We'll let, we'll let grandma do it. We're not going to be. And, and, and the truth is that many times, statistically speaking, when dad's out of the picture, the kids will soon follow. And so we want to really encourage you, especially if you're a dad, if you're a grandpa, if you're an uncle, like be that supportive, strong um, person, that part for that young person to look up to and say, oh, no, like, yeah, like Jesus matters, and we're going to celebrate that. So we'd really love to have you be a part of that coming up. Um, there's a sign-up in the middle hallway that has a Superman, Super Lad on it, and so you can sign up for that. And like I said, it's just going to be a good afternoon, a lot of fun. There's going to be good food and just a chance to hang out and kind of let the boys be the boys for a little while. And so that's coming up, and I hope you can make it to be a part of that. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is by you or uh, a seat or the seat that you're on or the seat you're beside is a welcome card. Um, what we would love for you to do, I know we had these out last week also, we would love for you to fill one of these out if you'd like to. Um, we're not going to hunt you down. We're not going to beat you up if you don't. Um, but what we would love is to get information so that we can keep you connected to our church. Specifically, the email is a big deal for us. Um, we're working on a new email marketing. You'll probably see it. It's called Email Octopus. Um, so if you see that, you're like, what's that? It's a way for us to be able to send out information from our church to you. And so lots of times that might be a prayer chain of someone that needs prayer. If there's an accident or a situation, um, it will involve the weekly bulletins, the monthly newsletters. Anyone is welcome to fill one of these out. We would love for you to do that. You can stick them um, on the back table. You can leave them where you're actually sitting, and we're going to come through between services. But this is just a way for us to stay connected with you and to plug you into what's going on at the church. So sometimes an event changes or you forget about something, and we send out a reminder, it helps. We'd love for you to fill one of these out if able. Um, and also, in addition to this, in the foyer, um, on the north side of the foyer, there is a new directory that we've made up. And so this is our, we're going to be printing this either this week or next. Um, and if you want to check that out and see if you're in there, uh, we want you in there. I want to be really clear about that. Like, we want you in our directory if you're wanting to or willing to be in our directory. Um, but obviously, we don't have everyone in there. And so it's not a, we're going to hunt you down and make you feel bad if you're not. But we're just trying to get everything straight and cleared away. Uh, especially with COVID, it's hard to know who is us and who's not. Like I told Mary Helen, it's hard to, to, to make sense of everyone that we have, and that's including you guys that are online. We'd love for you to be included in that. Um, but we just we, if we don't have your information, we can't list the information. And so anyways, that's kind of a, a lot of rambling from the preacher, but really we'd love for you to fill one of these out and um, just give us a chance to get connected with you. If you've already given us this stuff, you should have gotten a couple emails this week from us. Uh, if you didn't get emails from us this week that were like a welcome, that means something's not right on our end or on your end, so let us know. Um, I know there's one or two emails that they think they should be getting it, but they're not, so maybe we just need to fix that. But let us know that, because we don't always know who's not getting those things. So that's what's going on there. Um, other than that, uh, I'm just glad that you were here this morning. Um, I, I'm thankful to be a part of church. I'm excited about this morning. We're wrapping up the blank slate um, sermon series on Romans. We're going to cover Romans 8. It's a great chapter. We're going to have a special uh, drawing illustration um, by Emily G., who's one of our high schoolers, um, that I think will be very, very good for you visually to understand how much God loves you and where he wants us to live, the sweet spot of Christianity. So I'm excited about that coming up. 
Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to open up with a word of prayer, and then Lauren and Jenny are going to come and lead us in worship, and then we're just going to we're going to be together as a family today. So will you pray with me? Father, this morning, um, I thank you for sunshine. Uh, I know it's probably not as warm a sunshine as we'd like just yet, but I thank you for the reminder um, that you're with us every day, uh, that we can trust you, that you're faithful. Uh, God, I just pray this morning that as we gather here in worship, that you would uh, show up and be amongst us, that as we lift up our voices in song, you'd fill us with your hope and your goodness, that you would uh, remind us of your glory. Um, God, we just pray this morning that you'd help us, that you'd shape us, that you would uh, fill us with your spirit so that we can love people really well and that we can love you even better. Um, God, I just pray for your presence here this morning as we gather. I thank you for the, the hope that we have in Jesus, and I just pray we would worship you um, with joy and gladness this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, you know, one of, my, one of my good friends I think had on Facebook this week, uh, the difference between a good day and a bad day is your attitude. Um, and I really like that. Thanks, Craig. Um, but I really like that because I think it's true, and I think the same is true of worship. I think sometimes, like, church is like, oh, that was a good church, but that was a bad church. Lots of times that depends on our attitude. And so I just invite you to make today a good day. Um, open up your heart, trust in Jesus, and let's see what he does with it. So if you guys want to stand up, give someone beside you at least a smile or a hi, and then uh, let's worship together today. Good morning, brother. How are you? Not too bad. Okay. I'm good. Good morning, Sally. Good morning, morning. Are you nervous? You got it.
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. say I am really excited about that whiteboard today. I don't know exactly what's going on with it. I'm excited to see what it is. I know God's going to use it to to be a blessing to us. I also pray that we are frantically taking that thing down so somebody can use that baptismal today. Today I want to talk about rejoicing. Um Psalm 118, 24 says, This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. About I can do this. About three and a half years ago,
My wife found our daughter having a seizure. After about a year and a half of doctor's appointments, diagnoses, different medications, we got it under control. About two weeks ago, we celebrated two years seizure free. I don't think I have to tell any one of you what that means to our family. How much we rejoice in that. And as I've been praying about that, I've been thanking God for for two years over the past couple of weeks. It hit me a few days ago that this time right now that we're about to share in, we should be rejoicing like that. You think about the sacrifice that, not only the physical sacrifice that, that Jesus made for us, but the gift that we gain from that, the gift that we gain from making that decision. We're about to partake in the, the elements that, that remind us of that weekly, and I just, my encouragement to you guys today is to, to rejoice in that, to just, I hope you get goosebumps like I have right now. I hope the hair stands up on the back of your neck when you stop and think about what these truly signify. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you for the two years that you've given to Julia. I pray, God, that everyone in here today truly stops and thinks about what it means, what we're about to do, the sacrifices that were made, the gifts that were given. And God, I pray that if it's on anybody's heart today to make that decision to follow you, that they don't wait another minute, that they make that decision. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning again, everybody. So we've been spending some time working through the book of Romans. And uh, the book of Romans, uh, if this is your first one that you're catching or that you're, you're learning about, uh, the book of Romans is, is basically the definitive work that we have within the Bible. Obviously, the Bible is all valuable and all, all beneficial. But the, the Romans is the book within the books of the Bible that really gives us what it means to be a Christian, to be a Christ follower. It's long, it's complicated, it's, it's fairly deep theologically. Uh, I've used the words courtroom and classroom to describe it because oftentimes what we find in the writing of Paul, what we find in the book of Romans, when we read through this, it feels like a legal argument being made in a courtroom. Paul is defending the faith, he's calling out Christians, he's pointing us to a certain way to live, and in that way, it's very, very, very legal in, in the, the nature. It's a, it's a lawyer making a case, presenting an argument. Yeah, it also feels a lot like a classroom. Some of what he teaches, the words that he uses, justification and sanctification and predestination and all these things that he gets into are, are very complicated and complex. And sometimes that overwhelms us as followers of Jesus to the point that we get almost thrown off. It, it, for, for those that are new in Christ or new in their faith, when you start reading the book of Romans, it's easy to just kind of let your eyes get crossed and you kind of go, well, I don't know what he's saying because of all the big words. But what we've tried to do is, is just try to clear that slate and say, okay, what really, what really is Paul getting at in this book of Romans? And so what we did is we, we had this moment where we started going, the, Paul starts right off the bat, right? Romans 1 says, it is the gospel, and gospel means good news. And what Paul's going to say is, if, if you miss the whole book, don't miss the, the meaning. The meaning is there's good news for you and I in Christ. Because there is a gospel that's happened. Gospel refers to, to, uh, to a hero coming back from war, from a commander coming back from a victory. And that commander comes back and tells the village, tells the community, tells the town, hey, I've got good news. The war is over. And we won. You don't have to come and fight. You don't have to put it more forth effort. You're not under slavery anymore. There's good news. Paul starts Romans and he just simply says this. There is good news for you and I because of what Jesus did on the cross. He fought the battle, he won the war, and because of that, you and I are free, clear, and at home with the Lord. We, we have that great peace. And Paul says, Paul says, if you miss, miss everything else, don't miss, there's good news, there's gospel. And then he, get, then he begins to make this argument, though, right? And he defines that the wrath of God is the words that he uses in Romans 1. The wrath of God is coming. And you're going, wait, I thought there was good news. There is, but there's, the wrath of God is coming. And then he goes to describe those outside the church of being guilty or, or worthy of wrath, right? And he says they're senseless, they're lawless, they're faithless, they're cruel, they're evil. They don't even listen to their parents, right? And, and, and all everyone in the church says, yeah, those people are awful. And then we get to Romans 2 and 3, and Paul says, yeah, yeah, they're really bad. And so are all of us, right? That, that we get all tore up. We're, we're, we're just as bad that our sinfulness still separates us. Paul says in Romans 3, the wage, or, uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul says, yeah, them and those and me, we all fall short of the glory of God. And then he introduces us to that topic of justification. And says, listen, you and I aren't going to earn our way into heaven. We're not going to accomplish our way into heaven. We can't give enough, pray enough, read enough, say enough, save enough to accomplish or earn heaven. It happens by the gift of God through his grace when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. He gives us the illustration. Uh, it's calling my dad. I don't know why. He gives us the illustration, right? of Abraham, saying that Abraham was justified by faith. We get to Romans 5, and we hear the promise and the peace of hope of heaven. We get to Romans 6, and he describes baptism as this taking on of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Last week, we get to Romans 7, where it, he dealt with the conflict that all of us face. And if you're here this morning, I, I got to believe you love Jesus. You want to love Jesus. If you're here this morning, I got to believe that you're going, I, I believe in Jesus. But, but belief isn't just some abstract thing as in I believe in China. It's, it's, it's an action. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a commitment. It's a trust in. And Paul says there's this tension, right? Because I don't understand what I do, Paul says in Romans 7. I want to do good. I end up doing bad. I don't want to do bad. I can't seem to figure out how to do the good. And Paul describes this tension. He gets to the end of Romans 7 and he says this. He says, what a wretched man am I? He asks the question, who will rescue me? And then he gives a declarative statement, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, right? There's the honesty of saying we're broken. There's the humility to ask for help. And there's the heavenly gift of Jesus. And that brings us to Romans chapter 8, which is probably maybe, maybe the most beautiful, most wholesome, most full chapter, maybe in all of the Bible. I don't mean to take away from the resurrection of Jesus, but what Romans 8 does, Romans 8 
honestly, you could preach on for weeks and weeks and never get to the depths of it because Romans 8 is our victory chapter. Romans 8 is, is the, kind of the, the, the first conclusion Paul makes for all the courtroom arguments and all the classroom discussion. Paul gets to Romans 8 and he says, listen, here's what it means. It means victory in Jesus, right? It means victory in Jesus. And so as Emily's working up there, I want you to think about that concept of victory in Jesus because that's what Romans 8 really is. Romans 8, if, if, you're, if you're an outliner, an underliner, or a circler in your Bible, you just need to like highlight the entire book or the entire chapter of Romans 8. Romans 8 is so full of why you and I are Christians. It's so full of the promises that God makes available through Christ. And again, it's the, kind of the conclusion of this argument of, of justification by faith and that we're all sinners in need of a Savior and that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here, here's what this looks like, okay? And you can kind of see it up there as Emily is drawing it, and I appreciate her. She, she's done a great job drawing other things, and she's, she's got this all up there for us now. Here's, here's what our lives look like. Here, here's what it kind of comes down to, okay? You and I, you and I have faced, have faced a tension in our life as we've grown up. We have faced a tension of, of wanting to live our own life, but also wanting to follow God. And, and, and a couple things are going to happen. On some extremes, some of us are going to end up over here in the world of license. Man, we're going to do what we want, when we want, how we want, and ain't nobody going to tell us any different. Right? And, and the Bible says in Romans 1, that's going to lead us to wrath, right? It's like a guy jumping into the ocean going, I don't care, I'll do what I want. It's my body, my, my choice, my life. We live in this world of license. And, and God says, no, 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 that's going to lead to wrath. Because God says the wages of sin is death. And so, so then some of us hopped out of that, and we're like, okay, okay, then it's, then it's about the law, right? It's about following the rules. Tell me what to do, what not to do. You know, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. And we, we're like, man, I'm just going gonna, gonna, gonna to earn my way in. I'll be good enough. I'll be better than. I'll, I will accomplish whatever I need to accomplish. And, and, and Paul says, no, 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 that's legalism, right? That's like a guy stuck in a prison trying to climb his way all the way up to God. It ain't going to work, right? Paul spends a lot of time in Romans going, listen, you can legalize yourself to death. You ain't going to be good enough for God. And some of us, especially us in church, we fall into that category. We got our don'ts and our don'ts and our don'ts and our do's and our don'ts and our do's. And boy, we just try really hard and we just press on and we maybe have had conversations with people. Man, if you just stop doing this, well, then your life would go better. If you just start doing that, you just got to clean up your act. You got to follow the rules. We just get exhausted because the hill is high and we can't climb it. And so, and so we bounce back and forth, and that leads to wrath, and that leads to us. What do we do? We find liberty. And how do we find liberty? Through the Spirit and by faith. And we experience the Father's favor. favor. Listen, what I want, I want to share with you today is this picture come to life. I don't want us as a church to, to get caught up in license and lawlessness, where we just think God loves everyone, so it doesn't matter. No, it matters. God has a plan for your life and for mine. God has a desire for our actions and decisions. God says, God says, don't live in license and lawlessness, right? You're going to jump in the ocean, you're going to drown, or a shark's going to eat you. It's going to eat you up, and that, that sinful lifestyle is going to destroy you. God also says, my, my, my relationship with you is not based on the rules that you follow. It's on the love that I express. My relationship with you is not contingent on how perfect you can be. Rather, it's on how perfect my son was. And so we can't get caught up in the legalism. Instead, God says, I invite you to liberty, to true freedom in the spirit, to by the spirit being sanctified, being made more right with Christ, and to experience then the Father's favor, standing on the hill with God's blessing over us, doing what we do in love, out of love, and experiencing the greatness of God on the cross and what he gave us. So what's that look like in Romans 8? Well, there's a couple passages today that I want to walk us through, and, and hopefully this will connect the dots for you. The first verse, if you have your Bibles open, go to Romans 8. Uh, we're going to just kind of focus on, I think it's about seven, seven to eight verses total. But I want to read these verses and then share some truths with you this morning. Because Romans 8 is our victory in Jesus chapter. It's our victory in Jesus promise. Here's what it says in Romans 8, 1 and 2. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Here's the first promise we have in Jesus in Romans 8, and it's simply this. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's consequences, yes, but no condemnation. Here, here's what I think. I think sometimes what we want from God is we want out of our consequences. 
I think I, over the years in ministry, I meet a lot of people who show up to church hoping they can get away from their consequences, right? I've been a fool. I've been an idiot. I've been foolish. I've been stupid. Man, can I just come to God and, dear Jesus, please help me not pay for my, you know, my sins. Help me not to deal with the consequences. Romans 8 doesn't say there's not going to be consequences for our choices. In fact, the Bible is pretty full of results where people had to suffer the consequences of their sins. But we don't have condemnation. In fact, I think sometimes if we were really honest, I think a lot of us want to get rid of the consequences and we don't really think much about the condemnation. Romans 8 gives us this promise that because of Jesus, you and I cannot be condemned. That in Christ, with Christ, and because of Christ, I can't be condemned. Can I sin and have some consequences? Oh, yeah, for sure, buddy, right? I lose my temper. You make a bad decision, right? You, you do this, you do that. You walk that road, you do this thing. There's consequences, right? Broken relationships, busted trust, uh, you know, sinful, sinful consequences for sure, but no condemnation. Listen, there is a peace that passes our understanding when we realize that, like, at the end of the day, I'm going to stand before the Father, and I am fully justified and clean. I've been broken. I've been miserable. I've made bad mistakes, and there's consequences for them, but I am not condemned. Here's what I know. I know some of you have been broken, you've been miserable, and you've made lots of mistakes, and maybe you're suffering the consequences for that. Maybe there's some broken relationships in the past. Maybe there's a huge mountain of debt because of your decisions. Maybe there's a criminal record keeping you from a job. Maybe there's regret and shame and guilt because of who you've hurt and how it's gone down. Some of that is consequences. But this morning, I want to remind you of the victory we have in Jesus, that there is no condemnation. That in Christ, because of Christ, and with Christ, you and I are fully clean and not condemned. That gives me great hope. Right? That gives me great encouragement. We talked about, you know, the, the laying down our old chains, taking up our new name. In Christ, we get a new name, right? We're, we're made new, we're made whole, we're made complete. We're not who we've been, we're not what we've done. Instead, we're what he is and what he's done. That we wear the name of Jesus confidently and courageously going, yeah, that, that, I've done that. Yeah, I'm suffering because of that, but I'm not condemned from it. The second passage I want to share is Romans 8, 12, and 13. So it skips down a little, and again, there's so much, but I, I got little time, lot to say. This is what it says in Romans 8, 12 through 13. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Here, here's the second truth that we need to see from Romans 8. The victory in Jesus is that we get an opportunity through the Spirit and not an obligation to our sin. I, I put this picture up there because there's this woman almost buckling under the weight of all that she's carrying, all the baggage that she's accumulated. I, I, I scrolled for, you know, heavy burdens and all I could find were a bunch of women doing the work that men probably should be doing. But, um, but, but I like this picture. I like this picture because I know I've met people like that. I know I've talked to people like that. I know people like that come to church. And I know a lot more people like that that are scared to come to church. Because they filled their bags with sin, they've ruined their relationships with their choices, they've overwhelmed their spirit with sorrow, and they don't feel like they can walk through those doors, or they're convinced that God would never love them, or they're, they're, they're just so set that they've just got to sit in their sin. Listen, Romans 8 provides, and, and I, there's more to that passage, but I don't have time to get into it. Paul just says real simply, you are not obligated to your sins. Just because you've been a drinker, you don't have to stay a drinker. Just because you've sexually sinned doesn't mean you have to keep sinning sexually. Just because you've been really bad with money or you've not been generous or you've got a bad temper or you've always been greedy or you've dealt with your pride or you can't get away from your jealousy doesn't mean you have to live in that. That's an opportunity through the Spirit. Paul says, listen, we have an obligation, but it's to live in the Spirit. Not an obligation to get stuck in our sins. Not an obligation to think that it's only that what we, what we can become. One of, the, one of the people that I always tell often is, is, is the story of Bernie Woodsky. And, and, and Bernie's been gone for quite a while. If you're old like me or you've been around the church a long time, you remember Bernie. I, I met Bernie Woodsky probably when he was in his mid-60s. 
And Bernie was the softest little teddy bear of a dude that you would ever meet, right? Like he had a little grizzly white beard. He had, I mean, he was like four foot four. Like he was really little, carried a cane most of the time. He drove like 17 miles an hour out to church every week in his old little beat up car. And he was just a nice little guy. He kept journals of prayers for you and I and for this whole church. He would come on Sunday mornings and he'd get here about an hour before service and he would go room to room to room to room and he would pray in every room. Most rooms, if they had a board, he'd write, God loves you and so do I on it. Bernie was an incredible prayer warrior for our church and was just, a, a, just one of the godliest men that I've ever met in my entire life. But if I'd have met Bernie 20 years before that, I'd have seen him on the street beating people up because they talked bad about him. If I'd have met Bernie 30 years before that, he'd have been indulging in a whole lot of garbage and junk that he had no business indulging in. But Bernie, through the Spirit, found out the opportunity that he had, and he threw off the obligation to his sins, and he made a difference for a generation and for a life and for me of showing me what it means to walk with Jesus. Listen, some of you right now maybe are going, I ain't never going to be that guy. Maybe we need to realize the opportunity we have through the Spirit to be different than who we've been, and we need to throw off the obligation to our sins. Third passage, right? There's no condemnation, no obligation. This third passage uh, is, is really, really valuable as well. This is what Paul says, Romans 8, 18. Paul says this, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole world, that the whole creation has been groaning. The whole creation has been groaning. Here's what it looks like. Victory in Jesus is about lasting freedom, not just our lingering frustrations. This week, I woke up on Thursday, and my elbow hurt. I got a little bruise on it. I didn't think I moved enough this week to hurt my elbow, but it hurt. Don, I think on Wednesday morning or Tuesday morning, ended up, I don't know, Judah jumped into his bed, so he jumped out on the couch or some other bed. Uh, Don's one toe, he showed me a picture of it. It is nasty. He kicked the end of his bed, and he like totally messed up his toe. And by the way, I don't want to see those pictures, okay? Like every once in a while, people are like, oh, look what's going on with it. Like, I'm your preacher. I'll pray for you. You don't got to show me the pictures, okay? Um, Right, right? My, my son this week, he, he, he's a nail biter. Anybody else a nail biter, right? Yeah, and he's like, Dad, you know when you bite your nail, but like there's a little piece under it, and you know you got to pull it out, but you know it's going to hurt, right? And so he pulled it out, and he's like, oh, my nail just hurt, right? Like, you've had those. My Michigan State Spartans are terrible at basketball right now. All those things are, are frustrating, right? Paul says this in Romans 8. He says, there's some lingering frustrations that you and I are going to go through. The creation is groaning in agony. Some of them are kind of playful. We can laugh about them, right? A busted up toe, sore elbow, a bad sports team. Maybe the stock market didn't do what you wanted, right? Maybe your car broke down. Maybe your dishwasher won't, won't fully get rid of the water. Those are some frustrations. And then there's some real lifers. Craig sharing about his daughter having seizures for a year and a half. He didn't give you much detail, but I can just say that would have been like hell on earth. Wondering every night if your 13-year-old daughter is going to have a seizure that takes her life. Wondering if she's going to be breathing. Wondering as you sleep if she's really sleeping. That's a frustration. A little bigger than a cuticle that doesn't work or an elbow that's kind of sore. Some of y'all have been to the doctor and they've dropped the cancer word. You hear words like terminal. I know within our church, many that are going to be here today aren't a year removed from, from losing someone that meant the world to them. They passed away, we did the funeral, and you're left grieving and carrying the, the burden. That's frustration. Paul says here in Romans 8, he says, the whole creation groans in agony, waiting for it to get better. I want to share a Facebook post of a, of a preacher friend of mine, Pastor Cooper from D Ford. He wrote this, I, I think, last week. And I just, I love the way that he wrote this. Because I think this is Romans 8.18 in a nutshell. This is, this is Pastor Cooper's words. Many of you would know him. Uh, he, he says, this, says, hey there, I hope I can share this in a way that makes sense. My son Owen is eight now. 
I'm not sure how much some of you know about him, but he was born with a genetic disorder and is severely mentally handicapped. He doesn't talk, he can't follow directions, and I will likely have to care for him the rest of his life, feeding him, changing diapers, and bathing him. He recently started having seizures again, and so I've been praying more for him the last couple of weeks. As I pray for my son's physical well-being, I find myself in conflict. As much as I love my son and want God to heal him, it's hard for me to spend too much time praying about my son's earthly condition when I think about lost people that are on their way to hell. If God healed my son, his physical life and mine would seem to be much easier and more like what it's supposed to be. But I know that this life is the blink of an eye compared to eternity, and it would be far more tolerable to spend my whole life struggling and dealing with whatever challenges my son's condition brings in comparison to what awaits those who die in their sins. I understand that I don't necessarily have to choose between one of these things or the other, but I wanted to share this in hope that God might help someone understand the value of their eternal soul. God's love and care for you is infinitely greater than what I am able to express. The suffering of the cross helps us understand a little of the depths of God's love, but still falls way short. I appeal to you, as though God were pleading through me, turn from your sin, humble yourself, and be reconciled to God. I think what Pastor Cooper is really saying there is that in Christ, there is incredible lasting freedom. And too many times, we get caught up in the frustrations, the, the little ones like nails that hurt, and the big ones like cancer that kills, instead of realizing that in Christ, we have an eternity waiting for us forever. Uh, the best way I could describe it in springtime is simply this. If I told you that for the next week it would be zero degrees, but as, if you suffered through that, that for the next six months it would be 75 and sunny, we'd sign up in a heartbeat. Oh, a couple days of suffering, but we get the, the blessings of the better weather. Our lives are a dot in the span of eternity. I mean, it doesn't mean the suffering's not real. It doesn't mean the frustration doesn't hurt. It doesn't mean the tears don't flow. I'm not cold or callous or trying to say that your suffering doesn't matter. It matters greatly to God. But we need to remember that there's a victory in Jesus that leads to lasting freedom and not just our lingering frustrations that we face. And there's one more part I want to share. Paul says this in Romans 8, 37 through 39, the end of this chapter. He says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I love this verse. I remember this being a verse that my grandpa Spears mentioned as being important to him. It's one of the only, I mean, my, my grandpa Spears loved God and, and was a faithful man. But this passage has a special meaning to me because that was the verse that he pointed out. I asked him towards the end of his life what was one of his favorite scriptures, and he said this one. There's nothing separating. Nothing's getting in between. I, I love it because in this passage, Paul actually kind of makes up a word. It's, uh, it's super conquerors. It's super conquerors. Paul, I, like, I feel like I, like I kind of relate to Paul that way. I like to make up words. And Paul was going like, man, we are conquerors, but we are more than conquerors. We are like, we're like super conquerors, man. Like we win, but like we, we win, win. And so he uses this word in Greek and it's like hyper nuka koia. I, I'm not good with my Greek. It, I apologize. But, but he makes up this word of like, I'm a conqueror, but I'm a super conqueror. And here's what I want you and I to know more than anything else today. In Christ, because of Christ and with Christ, you and I, we don't just win. We win, win. Right? Like, there is no separation. Height, depth, angels, demons, present, future, nothing separates you and I from the love of God. In liberty, we find the Father's favor. It doesn't come through legalism where we follow a bunch of rules. It doesn't come from lawlessness where we do what we want. It comes from the liberty we have in going, I'm a follower of Jesus. He has saved me faithfully, and I'm going to enjoy the Father's favor and his blessing because God loves me so much. I'm a super conqueror. Because Jesus loves me and I can't be separated from that. I can't be cut off from his love. And then we just end with this. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? If God's for me, I'm going to use my translation. What do I care who's against me? If God's got me, what do I care who wants to get me? If God's got you, then he's got you. 
And that leads us to victory in Jesus. No condemnation, not an obligation, no frustration, and not a smidgen of separation. Victory in Jesus. Paul sums up his legal argument in the courtroom and his deep discussion in the classroom by simply pointing us to Jesus and saying there is victory in him. My prayer, church, is that we live victoriously, that we take these words and we take these illustrations and we apply them to our lives. And in liberty, we live with joy and peace and gladness, knowing what we've been saved from, but also knowing what we've been called to, which is to share that message of hope with the kingdom, with, with anyone we come into contact with, with neighbors and friends and family, and we pursue, as long as we're able, the love of Christ to anyone that would hear it. Will you pray with me? Father, this morning, I just pray. I pray for us as a church. I pray we realize the incredible victory we have in Jesus. I pray that you'd help us to see that, that you don't want us to live in legalism, simply just trying to follow all the rules. God, we're never going to climb that mountain. We're never going to be good enough that way. And God, I pray that you'd help us to see that you do not want us to just lawlessly just grab this license and go do whatever we want. God, that, that you have a desire for our lives, our behavior of our hearts, the, the attitudes of our minds. But God, that's found in the liberty that we find through the Spirit. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, because of the saving grace that he extended, by us placing our faith, our trust, our hope in you, we experience the Father's favor. And God, I just pray that you would help remind us of this victory today. If there's someone here this morning who feels like they're already condemned because of the choices that they've made, remind them that there's no condemnation. God, if there's someone here this morning who feels like they're just always going to be who they've always been, I pray that you'd help them to see the opportunity that they have through the Spirit to change. God, I know there's a lot of people with really big frustrations. And it doesn't sound like a strong enough word. Because I know what they're facing. I can't imagine what they're feeling. And I know that they need your peace. But God, I pray that you'd remind us of the lasting freedom that we have in you, regardless of what those frustrations may be and how much pain they might cause. And God, maybe today, more than anything, would you remind us that there is no separation, that we can't be cut off from your love, that you don't turn your back, that when we simply trust in faith, God, you are the Father who loves us forever, that you, are, uh, you extend your favor and you offer us hope and you walk on the road beside us. God, if you are for us, may we remember that it doesn't matter who's against us. And I thank you, God, that you are for us. I just pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, um, we're going to do an invitation song. And by all means, the, the baptistry is open. I got to celebrate with Allison yesterday who made the decision to follow, her, follow him with her life. And uh, she went down into the water to die to her sins and to live to Christ. She went down into the water to... to, to to join in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. I'd be happy to celebrate with any of you this morning on that. But maybe more than anything this morning, what I want to invite us to do is we're going to sing an old song, uh, that uh, How Great Thou Art. And I just want to invite you to a moment of worship. Three minutes and 24 seconds, whatever this song is, of just worship. Of being reminded of the goodness of God, of the victory we have in Him. I, I know we're not probably loud singers here at the church anymore, right? There's not quite enough people, so someone might hear our voice. I, I, I understand all that. Some of us can't sing at all. Um, I'm going to invite you this morning. Sing a little louder. Just sing a little louder. I, I don't know what that means for you. Maybe you're like, I've never sang in my life. Just, just try whispering it. It's okay. Maybe you whisper. Try adding a little volume, right? It, it, maybe, maybe you're a holler. You know what? I'm good with that, right? Like, I'm just inviting you this morning. Spend the next three and a half minutes in worship, gratitude, and appreciation for a Savior who really loves you, for a Savior who really loves me. He's my Savior forever. Victory in Jesus. Will you stand as we sing your song?